Yeah, we've seen it just in the history of the White Horse Inn. When we first started doing uh, the program, we devoted several early shows. This was the time when Mike's uh, Agony and Deceit had come out, and there was great concern of the heresy taught by the word faith teachers. Mm -hmm. And now no one blinks. These guys are mainstream. These guys are part of the part of the evangelical movement. Nobody blinks that someone like T.D. Jakes has questionable views of the Trinity. Nobody blinks when yep. people deny the atonement. It's um, it's just part of this big amorphous blob, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, Mike. Yeah, in, in saying in your opening commentary that God exists primarily for my personal need yeah. changes everything. Um, and, and I think we've watched that. So that it isn't a great big problem if the atonement sort of disappears, hmm. as long as my need is met. You may need Christ for uh, solve your problem of, of anxiety or stress or loneliness, uh-huh. but uh, not to save you from your sins. No, and, and so think... that things that would cause churches of a prior generation to go into cataleptic fits simply aren't very big a problem. Yeah, that's really true. The problem is not just outright denial uh-huh. of, yeah. of, of yeah. Christian yeah. historic right. Christian doctrine, but it's distractions and and all of indifference. those indifference. In, indifference, and and it's because when when we and our felt needs are at the center, that's what dominates. So we are not really denying all of the the essential doctrines of the faith, but what we're saying is the whole purpose of Jesus coming was so that I could get a better job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what's really striking is to talk sometimes to pastors who are driven by marketing or by pop psychology or what have you, to sit down and talk to them, and they, they sort of have a, a look of surprise and wonder that we would have these kinds of critiques. They They say... Ask me any question. Yes. Yeah. And you, you ask them, well, what, what is your view of God? What is your view of humanity? What right. is your view of the fall and right. salvation and Christ and so forth? And you get orthodox answers. Yep. But then, actually, what's normative, what's authoritative, actually, what's the source for their preaching? What do they think is the mm-hmm. power of God unto salvation. What do they think is going to grow their church? What do they think is going to reach the lost? What do they think is going to be relevant and make a difference? And it's not the same answers yeah. yes. that they that's, just gave. That's, that's exactly right. right. That's right. To go back to the categories for my youth, this is the absolute triumph of heart knowledge over head knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, we used to talk about in earlier days having a doctrinal statement uh, that is in a safety deposit box in St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> You know, um, and the secretary my, who put it away is long since dead, so nobody yeah, knows where it is. Yeah, right? yeah. and and in my in the history of the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, there was in many ways a sort of a we don't care what you've got in that document. We care what your pastors are doing in your parishes throughout the country. If they're not doing that, don't bother to bring the document out and show me. Yeah, you know, and that's the sad thing about yeah. a lot of uh, contemporary pastors, they feel the need to cater to those distractions. And so when you talk about the power of God, um, the, the dis- to them, the, the display of God's power today is in overcoming this barrier or this obstacle or this, this personal crisis rather than the power of God displayed in the gospel. So we're really looking at uh, two different uses or two different understandings of the power of God. You're listening to the White Horse Inn, and we're talking about our new series for 2008. Priceless Christianity. Stay tuned for more of this discussion just after this break. Welcome back to the White Horse Inn. I'm Michael Horton, and we're discussing Priceless Christianity. Paul says to Timothy, in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, boastful, proud, arrogant, lovers of money, uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And Timothy, when you find yourself in these circumstances, Take surveys, get the pulse of the people, and tailor your messages yes. to attract people hmm. to a gospel that hmm. will satisfy those needs. Yeah. No, he says, preach the word. I charge you in this situation to preach the word. In the season and out of season. When it's popular, when it's not. When it seems to work, when it doesn't seem to work. Keep your head down. You do the work of an evangelist. Proclaim this gospel and yet what's really significant about the super apostles as he mm-hmm. as Paul calls them in 2 Corinthians is that they're not coming in and saying 
Jesus is not God. Exactly. They're not coming mm-hmm. in and saying right. there is no Holy Spirit. Instead, they are redefining exactly what these words yes. or names mean. And don't we see the same thing today where, for instance, you have all the same words, God, yep. Jesus, uh-huh. Bible, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. You have the same words and even appeal to the, the miracles of Jesus, mm, his yeah. earthly ministry. Yeah. You know, and that's the amazing thing. See, I. I I really do believe that the seduction of the super apostles was different from all of the other uh, challenges that were faced in in the New Testament. The challenge was was different from what Paul faced with the Galatian churches, what what he was concerned about with the Colossian churches. Because as you mentioned, Mike, the seduction of the super apostles was to use orthodox terms and fill them with different meanings and thereby redefine Christian ministry mm-hmm. so that the minister was was defined not by his doctrine as we see in in other new testament writings but he's defined by his signs of success and by his eloquence of speech and his personal appeal even that name that of derision that Paul called them super yes. apostles yeah. yes. underscores it they didn't say it wasn't heresy by subtraction but by addition it mm. was you guys, followers of Paul, you guys have the apostles. We have the super apostles. You have Jesus. We have the super yeah. Jesus. You have the spirit. We have the super spirit. The new and improved. New yeah. and improved. We have something that's just a little bit better than your ordinary run-of-the-mill yeah. word and sacrament ministry. Uh-huh. And Paul goes on in that passage. She's very harsh language. Yeah. Of these These are false teachers. They deceive, they're deceptive, they appear to be one thing, and they're really not. And at the end of the day, Paul attributes their power to the deception of Satan. Yeah, if, he this does. Is, if you want to worry about what the devil does, the devil tells lies about God, yeah. heresy. And in this case, it isn't so much as you say, Mike, and not, not rejection of things, but it's the, the redefining, dumbing down, uh, the, the play on felt needs as opposed to what God says are true needs are all of those things. Isn't, and, this, and, isn't this what C.S. Lewis said in the screw tape letters where... The, the devil tells his assistant, here's what we've got to do. We're never going to really have a lot of success if we just come right out and deny things. What we need right. is Christianity and. Yes. Mm-hmm. Convince yeah. them <clears throat> yep. to become yep. tired of the old and the familiar, uh, the tried and the tested. Get them attached to some new thing like Christianity mm-hmm. and dieting. We, or we Christianity a- and the war. Or Christianity mm. and... Yeah. We not only have a record of this in the Corinthian epistles, but go back to the book of Judges, hmm. where uh, Joshua ordered Israel to cast out all the Canaanites, and they did pretty much, but they left a few of them around. And before long, the Canaanites are kind of sneaking back into the land, and where the Levites have built shrines to worship Yahweh, pretty soon the Canaanites come back, and they build a little statue of Baal or an Asherah pole right next door, and before long, it becomes one building instead of yeah. two, and... <laughs> Yeah. The Canaanites are worshiping Yahweh a little bit, and the Israelites are worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth a little bit. <laughs> so the way that we have other Christs and other spirits, still using the words but redefining mm-hmm. the content, is to say, all right, now the Bible defines these words, for instance, sin, as any transgression of God's law or lack of conformity thereto. We define sin in relation to our own sense of Mm self-esteem, falling short of our best intentions and life goals, not having our best life now. The therapeutic culture redefines sin so that we can still use the word, Mm -hmm. but now it means something completely different. And we used to accuse the cults of this, and we were right, Hmm. um, that you had all the same words with new definitions. But now we find the same method going on and drawing thousands of people. Um, In our early days in the White Horse Inn, I don't think we would have said of the evangelical movement that Christ's name wasn't mentioned. Hmm. But now... Over uh, 17 or 18 years, yeah. um, Yeah. You don't need to mention his name. Not really. 